take a look at this. What do you see? Just a woman walking and a fish. Yeah. Sure. I'm just seeing the woman. And Jim sees a fish. Dr. Bhandari, what do you see? I'd like to see the I confirm what they see. Okay. Well, this talk is deliberately provocative because you as surgeons will each see different things in this talk. Some of it, you see something else, Maria. You see a face. You see William Shakespeare. Yeah. Yeah. It's a tree. Some people see this. Some people see this wizened little woman. Uh, walking down the river Seine. Yes. And uh, that's the whole thing. This is this talk when I first gave it, uh, and I thank Shamim Khan, my reader, who was my ex boss, uh, for uh, doing most of this work. In fact, he has transformed himself uh, into a surgical uh, educationist. Uh, this talk was extremely challenging the first time around when it was delivered. Uh, at the EAU. And there were so many questions because different people saw different things in the talk. It is absolutely deliberate. So take a look at this now. This is something uh, which was a near disaster which happened uh, over New York. Take a look at this. You can hear it. Cactus 15.9, okay, uh, you need to return a little body. Turn left heading up uh, 220. Two, two, Stop your departure, he's got an emergency returning. Okay, it's 1529, he, uh, third strike, he lost all engine, he lost the thrust in the engines, he's returning immediately. Cactus 1529, which engines? He lost thrust in both engines, he said. Got it. Cactus 1529, we can get it to you. Do you want to try to land 1913? We're able, we may end up in the Hudson. All right, Cactus 1529, it's going to be left traffic to runway 31. Not able. Okay, what do you need to land? Do you want to try to go to Teterboro? Yes. Teterboro, uh, Empire. Actually, LaGuardia Departs guy, emergency inbound. Hey, guys. Check is 1529 over the George Washington Bridge. He wants to go to the airport right now. Want to go to the airport? Check. Does he need assistance? Uh, yes. He, uh, it was a bird strike. Can I get him in for, uh, runway one? Runway one? That's good. Check is 1529. Turn right 280. You can land runway right. one at Teterboro. We can't do it. Okay, which runway would you like at Teterboro? We're going to be that. I'm sorry, say again, Cactus. Cactus 15.9, radar contact is lost. You also got Newark Airport up at 2 o'clock in about 7 miles. Eagle 5.4718, Can I say, thank goodness you're alive? If you were in the apartment, then thank goodness. You're alive. And the reason for showing you this is not because <coughs> you think that it was the technical skill of the pilot that saved all those people. Because a Hudson River landing had never been done before. It was actually also his non-technical skill. If you listen to what is happening in the background, they're asking him to go to LaGuardia he completely stops listening to the guys on the ground. He makes a split-second decision that in order to save the lives of many thousands, if not millions of people in Manhattan, he was willing to sacrifice the lives of those people on the aircraft. He made that decision himself, contrary to what everyone was telling him from the ground, because he knew there was no way he could get to LaGuardia. He made a judgment call. He would rather have killed 400 people and not money men. He did not want to kill 3,000 people in Manhattan. Think about it. The next time you operate 
However good you are at your fellowship training, my friends, it is unlikely that your error on the console is going to kill a patient. It is what happens outside the console that could. And that's the challenge. Can we, as surgeons, who keep training our juniors to become great with our hands, ever accept that it is outside that matters as much as what is here in these fingers? Well, if you look at this article published last year in the IJCP, in 1,500 British patients, 10% had some or the other form of medical error. And 25%, one in four patients, said their care was poorly coordinated. And it became quickly evident that human error accounts for 75% or three in four of these problems. And again, I put to you, think twice before just training yourself in technical skills. The problem is that technological innovation is happening all the time. Tomorrow, it is single port. The day after, it is the stiff flop. Uh, and then it is cytotopic treatment straight into the prostate without perhaps having to remove someone's prostate entirely. How can you keep up with all this changing innovation all the time. How can you eliminate or reduce the morbidity to the patient, the initial part of the learning curve, each time you introduce something new? How can you get rid of the fact that with the European Working Time Directive, most of our juniors are having less time for training? Even if Jim wants to spend as many hours as he can in training them, these guys and girls want to have some quality time with their families. And I suspect even in the United States, there are governing bodies who are asking your juniors to keep diary cards on there. There probably are. And you may ask them to ignore the diary cards, but eventually it's going to catch up with you. And to top it all, <coughs> high-tech surgery means greater patient expectation. Remember the stroke paper the most significant article on robotic surgery two years ago in European urology. It was not about how great Menon's results were, it was how badly the expectations of patients who had robotic-assisted radical prostatectomy were dashed because they thought that they would all get their erections. Their expectations were very different from what reality was. So I, uh, in this environment, a few years ago, hired the only man who has a PhD on the subject in urology, to my knowledge, in the world. And his name is Kamran Ahmed. He's now a postdoc with us. Uh, Jim knows his, him well. And Kurshid Guru has been busy trying to nick him from me. So I had to threaten Kurshid with a baseball bat. Uh, but Ahmed, uh, looked at it as an educationist, saying four things. First, you need to assess what the specialist training needs are. Second, you need to develop programs. Third, you need to train the trainers. And fourth, you need to be able to assess the outcomes. So while uh, Jim does a great job, Jack, you do a great job, the outcomes that you're measuring perhaps are not the right outcomes for the educationists. They're the right outcomes for uh, the patients because they're doing well, you're doing a sterling job, but to an educationist, they're not the right outcomes. And if you then look in a systematic review at what simulation is bringing uh, to our trainees, the stuff that is available out there, whether it's the ROS system or the plug-in uh, behind the Da Vinci, is pretty good for the junior trainee. As the trainee becomes more and more senior, whatever you provide them is not good enough. And this is where we made a fundamental error, me included. I used to think, why is it if I put them in a wet lab, do they not just get good? This completely uh, perplexed me. It is because you cannot reproduce what happens around the surgeon in a wet lab or in any lab, or in any simulator whatsoever. That is impossible, and that is the factor, the human factor, that you equally need to account for. 
And therefore, we developed the STELI project now three years ago. STELI stands for Simulation and Technology Enhanced Learning Initiative. It was a London Deanery project funded to the tune of 1.5 million pounds and consisted of two arms in parallel. One is something that we as surgeons and urologists are all familiar with, part task training, and that is endourology, lab, robotic, you name it, we have it. But the other is non-technical skills or human factors or crisis resource management, which airline pilots of course learn in their own simulators and which is how he managed to do the job. Can we somehow teach our residents to do that? And the first thing Shamim and I had to do was train ourselves. So we went on courses, we went to our anesthetists, we went to our A&E consultants and we said, look, we want to learn from you as to how you deal with the crises. And there are various things you can do, but it is a learning experience, something that is never taught to us as surgeons. This is a traditional lab. Uh, I'm sure you have it at the VUI. You certainly have it in Roswell Park. And this is one of few labs that exists in the United Kingdom. Every possible simulator that you can think of, we have developed or purchased. And each of them have gone through phase, content, and construct validity. But at this time, in 2012, there is very little predictive validity i.e. no one knows for certain in a randomized fashion as to whether doing any of this makes your youngsters better surgeons and gives them better patient outcomes. That is the ultimate test which is currently being put to a randomized control trial but the answer is just not there. So all the others are available, predictive, just not there. Look at this. We started working on this project uh, with one of our computer scientists uh, in Sweden. And this is uh, the laparoscopic nephrectomy simulator. I sent Tim Nieders, who was my PhD student at the time, to actually learn how to write computer programs. And then James Bruin followed, who was my next uh, PhD in simulation, trying to content and construct validate it. So if you look at uh, the graphs, take any of them, green, gray, and red. On the y-axis is a measure of performance. So the better the performance of an expert at a laparoscopic nephrectomy simulator, the better it is. You should be able to differentiate between a novice and an expert on this kind of a simulator. Otherwise, it's not the worth, worth the money it is spent on. So this was beautifully uh, validated and in fact Tim and uh, uh, James both went on to get gold medals for their thesis. And then came Ali Bashum. This is the Sim Surgery SEP robot, again a new robotic simulator just like the Ross one or the Intuitive one. And Ali in fact comes from the King's College London simulation group which is a group of medical students. They are aspiring surgeons and they're very interested in simulation. In fact, you'll be surprised to know uh, that they can differentiate between who is possibly going to become a good surgeon by their performance on various computer games. And this is a beautifully uh, validated piece of work published in BMJ Open. So I thought this was all hocus pocus until I saw the data. But I, anyway, uh, the important point is these students within KCL, some of them, are beginning to self-select themselves. The problem is all they are looking at is technical skills they are not selecting themselves in human factors because at present there is no way of telling that. And Andrea Gavazzi, who uh, came from Florence, has gone back as a consultant there, again did a construct validity on the SEP robot. Again, the higher the value on the y-axis, uh, the worse is the performance of the surgeon, and orange uh, is an expert, uh, white is a novice, and therefore the novices, whatever test you put them on a robotic simulator, do worse uh, than an expert, and therefore this is worth spending your money on. But look, this is expensive stuff. Last month at the ISMH meeting, which is a simulator meeting in San Diego, Bashun, a fourth year medical student, completely blew the field away. 
there were millions of pounds worth of computerized kits all over the place trying to sell themselves, trying to show the signs and in between was little old Bashoon with a cardboard box and an iPad worth nothing. Unique piece of discovery, all you do is put an iPad on top of a hole in a box. You can record it, you can repeat your jobs at home and you can take it to your trainer and say this is what I did last week, this is what I did the week before, could you see whether my performance has improved. You can keep a real-time measure of your performance at home. So there is no excuse for not practicing just because you have got limited hours at work. You can actually do this with a cardboard box at home. The sad story is that King's College London business faffed about for six months not purchasing the IP for this. He came to the United States within seven days, a company, an American company, bought the rights and are selling this. The box has now become a lot sexier. The iPad is still an iPad, it's gone from one to three. But someone else bought the IP and thank God they did. Uh, and thank God we recognize uh, this young student who is actually a genius. Look at what happens over Fridays uh, every year at Guy's and now in a phased fashion in various parts uh, of the United Kingdom. The trainees will travel to a uh, central simulation facility whereby they and the faculty will train in various parts uh, of a process, whether this is TURP or robotics or ultroscopy, whatever. They will go to a Alberg wet lab because wet labs are not legal in the United Kingdom and these will then be assessed by task specific and global rating scales. As I said, if you remember that circle, unless you do the assessment, there's no point in doing the rest. So to have an effective educational program, you have to fulfill the circle. And this is the kind of feedback that you get on a Likert scale. Again, this is a five point scale where higher the value on the Y axis, the better is the performance on the day. And you will notice here that the average figure is four and a half with very tight standard deviations. So we are doing pretty well in our part task training. But what about the other bit, the decision making, the non-technical skills? I thought there was no way of simulating it until I realized that these factors are equally important. The first thing, Peter Jay, who is the head of simulation uh, within King's Health Partners, in fact, he's an a and &E consultant, said to me was, Proka, I know you surgeons love it. You think you are heroes. Heroes are dangerous. It's not whether you are right. It's not whether what is right, but who is right. And he reminded me that in South Wales, a few years ago, when the wrong kidney was taken out, it is clearly recorded by the nurses, not the surgeons. There's a poor little medical student in the corner, like Ali Bashun, who kept saying in a whimpering little voice, Sir, I think you're taking the wrong kidney out. No one listened to her. No one listened to her. Because she was a medical student, and the guys who were operating were like you and I, big ball surgeons. They knew better than she did. They took the wrong kidney out. They ended their careers, but more importantly, when the patient turned up in guys, we tried to do a partial nephrectomy, but the tumor was so big, he had to have dialysis. It ended the careers of many surgeons. It ruined the life of a patient and his family. Think about it. It can happen to any of us. The day we uh, start imagining it won't is the day it could happen. It doesn't have to happen many times and you can reduce the risk of it happening by going to a typical crisis resource management day. There you meet sim man and do five scenarios and then have a 15 minute debrief with the experienced team who are actually taught how to debrief. So this is Libby Thomas 
uh, with Simman and on the right uh, top slide you will notice that there is a computer room. The glass pane that you see in that computer room is a one-way mirror. So the team inside the computer room can see Simman, can see the entire team inside the Simman room and can change Simman's behavior from the computer room. So you can make uh, the mannequin have a hydrothorax, you can make the mannequin go into resection, uh, retention, you can make him bleed, you can do whatever you want and in fact the mannequin even speaks uh, to you. Open such size, it is a high fidelity simulator. You video the whole uh, environment, uh, this is not a blame situation, this is a learning process and then you go into the debrief room uh, and have a debrief. You learn from the mistakes you made, but equally you learn from the things that you did well. You learn to work and communicate as a team. And I've been uh, in one of these rooms many times as part of the learning process and I can tell you, it is extremely stressful. It's not easy. So we tested this uh, on 33 residents and 5 nurses and now this number over the last two years has gone up to 395 and countless nurses and they were again assessed by a validated questionnaire called Notex. And they answered other questions on a 14 point <coughs> scale and the 5 point Likert score. And the message I want you to remember is that over 90 percent of people who responded thought it was useful. Uniformly. Hardly any exception. Even the senior most of trainees, the chief residents amongst you, while they did not find training in a dry or a simulator lab useful because they had done it so many times in human beings, they found this extremely useful. And I think that this may actually be the missing link. Can we put the whole thing together? And this is hot off the press. This is a program called Distributed Simulation that we are running in urology in collaboration with Imperial College London where Roger Kneebohm is the man who invented this and in fact an educationist and a surgeon trying to look at what are the minimal things you need to have both part tasks, technical skills and non-technical skills in the same environment. The problem is to do that you need a virtual operating room. These are expensive they are difficult to produce and they cost a lot of money. So this is a virtual operating room. This is James Bruin doing a TURP. There is the scrub nurse. There is the anesthetist in the corner doing his crossword rather than looking at anything else. And you see a number of other things around you. Guess what? There's no patient. There is no anesthetic machine. These are all props. And this is in fact an igloo that you can deflate and inflate within 15 minutes. So you can do this, you can record it, and you can then debrief all in one go within half an hour. It is quick and it is rapid. Is this CG resection or is it? This is just a transurethral resection of the process. I mean, it's computer graphic or is yeah, it? Yeah, it is computer graphic. So here is uh, where the checklist is happening and it is part of the procedure where if the surgeon misses the checklist, he or she uh, loses a point. And again you will notice that the only thing that is real here is the screen. Everything else is just a prop. It is designed in a way whereby it looks like the real thing. You can hear the anesthetic machine beeping in the back. The anesthetist machine can be, can be controlled with a computer so that the patient can have a TUR syndrome or table start bleeding, etc, etc. The nurse suddenly starts saying, sorry, I put accidentally some hot water and that's what is going into the resectoscope. I'm sorry, sir. You can develop scenarios. You can record the whole thing. You can do lap nephrectomy. You can do robotics. You can do whatever you like with this and then be And this is absolutely new. This has never before been done. Let me spend the last few minutes talking to you about the only project which exists anywhere on earth 
uh, funded by the British Association of Urological Surgeons, which combines both technical and non-technical skills. This uh, BAUS is certainly ahead of the game on this. And the Simulate project, uh, of which I'm chairman along with Shamim, stands for simulation in urological learning and teaching. And as part of this, uh, we ask uh, a number of people, including BAUS members, uh, as to what they felt was the role of simulation in teaching technical skills to their trainers. So again, I want you to focus just on the red and the green bars. And the higher the value on the y-axis, the better is the performance. So majority of people who were asked this question agreed uniformly, without doubt, that simulation would be useful for their patients and for their residents. Now, they were also asked whether the resident should then go to a simulation lab, be competent there, and then be allowed to operate on patients. And rather surprisingly, 52% said, no, we do not think simulation can replace real life training. So we want you to organize a simulation program, and at the same time, we want these trainees to be learning on patients in parallel. So there were various other educational questions whereby we were directly challenging them as to whether if the patient was their dad, would they allow uh, this non-trained uh, person, the new uh, PGY1 guy, to come and operate on them without practicing on a simulator. And most of them would not answer that question because they didn't want it to get personal. The problem is someday it is going to be our dad or our brother or our mother or someone else. So while it may not be personal to us, it is personal to someone else who happens to be the poor relative of your patient. So you need to think of it in that way and stop thinking about practicing on your patients. But this is the more shocking uh, issue. When you ask senior surgeons as to what training they had in non-technical skills, whether it be communication, leadership, training the trainers, relating to other people within the team, look at those red values. 92% of us had no training in non-technical skills whatsoever. We just do it on the hoof and we think, we imagine, we are doing it well. And then if you ask them as to whether they want to be trained in non-technical skills, most of the senior surgeons agree. Again, the red graph, the higher the value on the y-axis, the higher is the concordance. Majority of senior surgeons think this is a good thing because they think they lacked it during their training years and they do not want their juniors to suffer the same fate. So I think the entire concept of see one, do one, and teach one is changing. I think we are going to have, in the next few years, a paradigm shift. C1, simulate many, do one competently, and then teach everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for having me. Practice safely, but not on your patients. Thank you very much indeed.